Thank you for listening to the Matt's Movie Reviews podcast, available on iTunes, Spotify, Podbean, and Stitcher. Also, please follow Matt's Movie Reviews on Facebook, YouTube, Parlor, and Instagram. And of course, be sure to visit www.mattsmoviereviews.net for the latest reviews, top 10 lists, and more. Now, on to the show. The shaft goes way down. Ready? See at the bottom. What do you reckon? Let's check it out. I tell you, this is incredible, huh? Hey. What the hell is that? Hello and welcome to the Matt's Movie Reviews Podcast. I am your host, Matthew Perkovich, and this is episode number 280. Releasing August 6th in Australian cinemas is Blackwater Abyss, a creature feature thriller in which five friends explore a remote cave system in the Northern Territory, only to find themselves trapped in the den of a vicious and hungry crocodile. Starring Jessica McNamee and Luke Mitchell, Blackwater Abyss is also a standalone sequel to the 2008 film Blackwater, which to this day still stands in my top 10 favourite Australian horror movies of all time. And I'm very happy today that joining me on the podcast is the director of not only Blackwater Abyss, but Blackwater as well, Andrew Trauke. Andrew, I thank you very much for joining me on the podcast. It's my pleasure. So... What we got here, Blackwater Abyss, is a sequel to Blackwater. Um, as I said before, one of my favourite Australian horror movies. Um, right. Now, Thank you. You, um, did you always, like I, a return to the Blackwater story or the or something kind of close to that? Is this something that's been cooking, brewing for a while? Uh, well, actually, to tell you the truth, I didn't write this script. Um, it was brought to me, and um, I hadn't been thinking of going back there because, you know, once you've done something like that, you think he'll move on, but um, it was a whole new scenario, and they were stuck in a cave. And you know, there's nothing like darkness to make a horror film or a thriller film uh, exciting. So it was, it was something I sort of thought, oh, this looks like a really fun thing to do. I'll put a do it. So that's how it came about. Yeah, that's really interesting because your previous features, the majority of them, you wrote the script yourself. So in this way, uh, you yeah. had two screenwriters working on it for you. Yeah, well, I actually had written the script and they brought it to me, and then we spent a process, did a process of uh, working it out, <clears throat> making it more closer to what I wanted it to be like, and how we'd film it, and you know, character development and that sort of stuff. So, but yeah, there was a fully formed script before I came on board. The first movie was a really kind of low budget affair. I remember reading interviews mm. with you. You're really inspired by the movie Open Water. You want to make something small, That's correct. Um, small, yeah. and just re- really, yeah, you know, low budget film. You went to you're in Oatley. You shot there, yeah. uh, which isn't far from Ireland, yeah. actually. Um, this film, yeah. though, uh, bigger budget, filmed in Queensland, um, if I'm correct. Yeah. And um, yeah. this time you're working on a set, not in like a, like in the natural kind of yeah. uh, area. Yeah. Um, but the yeah. film itself mm-hmm. is just just as thrilling, just as engaging of what you had before, oh, you. even though you're working like with like an artificial environment. Um, how do you achieve yeah. how do you achieve that working in a set and getting still getting that kind of that palpable kind of like feeling of environment and such, um, especially when compared to your previous films? It compares really well with those. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, look, I think um, for me, it's always I'm approaching it. It's not so, I mean, the environment's obviously incredibly important. Like I just mentioned, you know, being in a cave, it's going to be all black. But the real important thing is the emotion you're going to try and um, get across the audience. And obviously in this sort of film, it's more about fear and anticipation. That's for me. Um, I'm not a big gore fan. I'm much more about the um, prelude to the attack. Mm. Um, and so <clears throat> for me, it's just looking at that. Uh, script and going, well, where in the script are we going to get feel that tension and feel that um, anxiety and, and want to, you know, close our eyes? And so I just approach scripts from that perspective, which is, um, you know, you've got the story, but where in that story are we going to have these emotional beats, whether it be anxiety or relief or action or whatever? Um, and so once you look at the story from that perspective, um, then they would hopefully match up or at least be both as thrilling as each other or as suspenseful because that's what I'm focusing on. 
That's really interesting because I, I've watched all your films. I actually own the uh, the Andrew Trowkey box set. I remember when the, the Jungle ah, came out when you had the fundraiser. Wow. I have yeah, one of those. So yeah, um, yeah. yeah um, oh my goodness, good on you. Um, so <laughs> your use of tension is like really, really well done. Like the pacing, especially. Um, Thank you. You said before Thank the beats you. and such. Um, you mentioned just now. Yeah how much of it is in the script how much is it also in post because i imagine you work very closely with your editors to make sure those beats that pacing is also achieved so, so was the question how close do i work with the editor yeah in regards to getting that pacing that you had the the beats yeah, that you yeah, had in your yeah, script yeah yeah. yeah 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 no i'm in the atmosphere every day i'm not one of these people that just goes in and says oh yeah do this and then i come back two days later i'm, I'm there every minute of it <laughs> and um I love editing. I mean, if someone could just hand me all the pictures and I could just spend, you know, 10 weeks editing a film, that would be quite fun. Um, because, you know, you wouldn't have to go through all the pain of water and all those things. And and I, and I believe editing really is where things come alive. I mean, you know, obviously you've got to have the footage and the performances. Mm-hmm. And you, you can't just say the film in, in the edit, but the edit can really, really start to shape your material. And, you know, it's amazing how you just slip something two or three frames and all of a sudden it clicks or... So, yeah, I, I'm, you're right. I mean, in terms of pacing, I, I'm very, very um, involved with the edit. I remember um, talking to you years ago when The Reef came out, and we'll talk about working mm. in water. Um, and your answer yeah. is very much in, 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 in league with a lot of filmmakers that have worked in water. It's difficult. It's uncomfortable. Mm. But yeah. since then, I'm just curious, technology-wise, is, has there been changes mm. in tech, in camera equipment, et cetera, to make working in water uh, a little more achievable, a little more comfortable, or is it still the same kind of struggle as it was before? Look, I think you're right. I mean, you know, there were shots done with a GoPro in that film, which, you know, you wouldn't have thought, but, but because they shoot at 4K, I could, you know, shoot some of the crocodile on it, I could do other bits and pieces with it, um, and that was just me with a GoPro. So in that regard, it's really... And, and look, all the technology is moving along incredibly well, so I, I think you're right. I think it, it is easier, but it's still people struggling through all this water which is you know heavy and to be resisting you and and you know if you're in the sea then there's creatures in there as well and you know with this one the temperature of the water and, and the salinity because it's a set you've got to keep it clean so mm. people don't get sick yeah. so it, it is it is a big headache regardless of where you do it um <clears throat> just or and, and the fact that the technology is improving is helpful there's no doubt about it but you still got to get through water the crocodile itself in your film, um, with both Blackwater and The Reef, you went to great pains to try to get authentic footage and then you kind of mm, use that yeah. in your movie. Um, in this case, uh, a little bit of CGI there. Before, your, your, your yeah. relationship with CGI before, you were kind of not against it, but you were like, if I can find the real yeah. thing, I'll use the real thing. How, how did it work yeah. in regards to this movie? Did you uh, still find some authentic croc footage? Did you use CGI to copy stuff? Did you merge them together? How did it all kind of come about? Yeah, so um, I, I went up with a cameraman and we shot um, this amazing crocodile that's owned by this amazing guy. Hello, are you still there? Yes, yes, I am. Yep. Hello? Oh, yes. sorry, I didn't yep. um, Called Adam Britton. And he, um, he's got, you know, he's this amazing zoologist who happens to have a 15 foot crocodile in his backyard. <laughs> and the reason he has that is because he, he, he studies it and uses it for filming. So, you know, it's this cage which you can actually go under the water and be, you know, it's like a meshed off cage, shark cage thing, and you can see the croc under the water. So um, I, I definitely wanted to use all crocodile. The fact of the matter was we just didn't quite get all the shots we wanted. So there's, and I think it's only two, um, maybe maybe three, two or three CGI shots. The rest is all authentic crocodile. Mm. Um, uh, so, and, and then there's a, there's a model occasion, but the models are used very, very, very rarely. Um, and so, yeah, so... I'd say 85, 90% of the film is real crocodile. Um, because like you say, I, I, I really like the authenticity of that. The realism for me is what I think I, you know, I think I said this before, but <clears throat> you know, Stephen King's got this wonderful quote where he's, you know, once you see the zipper down the monster's back, the game's over. Yeah. And I, I totally agree with that. Like, you know, you can go to these films like Crawl and that, and, but it's more like a, you don't, I never believed that crocodile. I, it was more like a fun ride. It's more like a popcorn film. You know, you watch it because, Oh, you know, it's just a bit of a hoot. Um, but this film, I was trying to make more real than that. So, um, yeah, for me, using a real animal is always the ultimate, but sometimes they just don't do what you want them to do. I remember when we were also previously talked about the reef, we talked about sharks on film compared to sharks in real life i know you yourself you're a are mm. you still uh, i remember mm. back then you used to surf like you said you surf once a week are you still out there yeah. getting waves as well yeah 
Yeah, yep. Yeah, I just got out of the water then. Yeah. <laughs> and um, so, so your relationship with sharks and in the ocean, you're very much about yeah. shark, shark yeah. conservatism, etc. Um, conservationism, yeah. excuse yeah. me. What about crocs, though? Because uh, crocs, we're talking about very different mm. kind of beast here. Mm. Um, you had your friend yeah. who has his own crocodile. Once you're in there, once you're that close yeah. to a crocodile, what type of, of yeah. emotions go yeah. in your in your in, in what what goes through your head? Even though you're very much, you yeah. know. You're very much a lover yeah. of the ocean, lover of nature, but there's got to be some mm. trepidation, especially mm. considered the primal nature of us, us as a human beings. Yeah, no, no, they're they're, they're really like out of those two. Cro- if I had to face one of those, it'd be a shark any day. Cause yeah, crocodiles are just they're just cunning. You know, they, you know they're watching you. You know they're in a stealth mode. You know, as soon as you put your foot wrong, bang, they're going to go for you. You know, sharks, <clears throat> from everything I've read, it's just an accidental, unless it's maybe a tiger shark that's very hungry, but if it's a great white, it's probably an accidental uh, hit. It's checking out to see if you're free, but unfortunately, when it does that, it probably lacerates you. So, but with a crocodile, no, they're going for you. They want to eat you. Um, I, I felt a lot more, I feel a lot more dread around crocodiles than any other animal. You know, like, they, they, they yeah, they're, they're cunning. They just, you know that they're, they want to get you. So I, I um, you know, there were times filming this big croc where you go, where is it? And then you just see these little eyes just staring at you and go, oh my God, it's just there, you know? Um, so yeah, it's, very, it's, a, it's a frightening animal. Sharks, I guess you could say, their attacks are more born out of curiosity where crocs, it's more of a yeah. meth- methodical kind of thing there. Uh, that's that's my understanding. Yeah, you know, I mean, I've never had a shark attack me, but um, from everything you read, the experts tend to say, "Look, they're just experimenting. They're just trying to see if you're a food source or not." We don't really like humans. It's a mistake, and on they go most of the time, not always. Um, whereas the crocodiles, you know, they eat you. So I read that in the UK after their lockdown, the first film that was actually a new release mm. film that was in cinemas was your movie, mm. and um, I'd imagine yeah. that an opinion of a film at any circumstance is a nerve-wracking experience you put in the time and the effort there's so much at stake here mm. when it has that you have people kind of coming out of this stupor and they're going into a cinema for the first time and watching your movie is that is that experience enhanced even more so yeah i look it's, it's a great honor because you know um <clears throat> you, uh, you, you sound like you know a lot about the movie industry and you understand that Cinema screens are, are very uh, competitive uh, pieces of real estate, and it's only those that have got a lot of money, is like the big studios that can afford to, you know, chuck them on every screen and spend half a million or five million dollars on publicity, so that everyone knows they're out there. So to be have the opportunity with a small film like this, because it is small, like I mean, when you compare it to the, <clears throat> you know, the Avengers or anything like that, mm. uh, to be able to go out and be on a hundred screens, it's, it's really, really, it was a great thing. Um, you know, still under COVID conditions, only 25% full and stuff like that. But yeah, it was great. It was really good to see that it was getting a theatrical release in, in the UK. Oh, that was exciting. Um, just to end our interview, speaking of sequels, yeah. I've read that there might be a sequel for The Reef as well. Is this true? Oh, oh. You're very well researched, man. <laughs> yeah, there might well be. Um, and and that's um, something that I'm sort of working on. Um, like I, I don't really want to talk a lot about projects that haven't come into reality yet because yep. they seem to somehow get jinxed or something. But yes, no, there, there is a thought of that because, um, uh, yeah, I, I had an idea which I sort of fell in love with, so I decided to write it and all of a sudden... There was a script there, so now we're yeah going to see if we can make it. That's right. Well, before that comes out, for everyone out there listening, out in the cinemas August 6th, which is tomorrow, Blackwater Abyss. If you love your creature features with some bite, I really recommend you check it out. Go to the movie, support a strange film, and watch this movie. And Andrew Trowkey, look, it's always great talking to you. Like I said, a it fan is. of your movies. Um, so happy to see you mm-hmm. back there filming. I can't wait to see what you do um, in the future. And thanks a lot for joining me. Thank you so much, I really appreciate it.